excited to be here tonight. Yes, I'm fired up. I am ready to go. And the band is actually heading up um, at the start. We do not have really many announcements here off the front. We don't have a big old game plan, but we are going to dive straight in uh, to worship. And so we are fired up. We're excited. We have some amazing songs and really an amazing opportunity uh, to meet with God. And I don't know about you, but I am excited to worship. I am excited to sing. I am excited to give God the praise that he deserves. And I just haven't said this much uh, in a while. And I know that we, we should, especially sometimes with with students and with newcomers, and I just want to encourage you to sing, uh, to sing. If you're a believer, if you're a Christian, um, I would encourage you to sing and to sing loud even if you don't feel it. Like, sing until you feel it. Um, and if you don't sing, um, don't be goofing around with the person to your right, with the person to your left, because it's distracting to those around you. And so, again, we're fired up. Um, we're excited to worship. And so I am going to pray. But before we do, why don't you stand up? If you guys want to come down to the front, you can. Um, and we are going to go to God um, in worship. Father, we love you and we're so excited um, just to be able to be in your presence, to hear from you, to worship you, um, and to give you the glory and honor and praise that you deserve. And so God, I pray that you are lifted up in this space tonight. Um, I pray that uh, some of us can be encouraged and challenged at the same time to, to take a step in our walk with you. And God, one thing we know is for sure that you are worthy of everything that we have tonight. And so God, I pray that we respond accordingly. And it's in Jesus' name. Amen.
sing it to him. There's never been. There's never been. There will never be a God like you. A love so true. There's never been. There will never be a God like you. A love so true.
You guys can go ahead. And eat. How are you guys doing tonight? Everyone doing okay? Feeling okay? We're back, Edge. We're here. Cool. Well, uh, my name is Tony, and if it's your first time here with us tonight, we just have a few announcements for you. Um, the first one is this. You can get out your phones right now and go ahead and follow us on Instagram and Twitter. Here are our hashtags and handles behind us. Um, and if you want to go ahead and get updates every week, I want you to go ahead and text this number. What's the number, Edge? 89800. Text EDGE to 89800. I just checked today. There's 645 people that get our text message now. So that's a lot. There's not 645 people in here right now, but there's 645 people every week that are getting an invite, which is huge. Which uh, brings me to my next announcement is next week, it's going to be Oak Bridge's 15-year anniversary. Okay. So, one, we are off next Sunday, okay? There's no edge next Sunday. I know, that's sad. There's no edge. Uh, we're taking off for that weekend. But I want to encourage all of you in here to be here at 11 a.m., that second service next week. And we're going to all have a designated area, and I'm pretty sure we're going to take over the front four rows. Just the student section alone. We are going to take over these front four rows across uh, the entire um, auditorium. So I want to encourage you guys, sit with your groups next Sunday at 11 a.m. Be here for Oak Bridge 15-year anniversary. It's going to be huge. Pastor Tom always goes all out. I don't know if you're here this morning, but we had uh, snacks and food, and uh, it's going to be next week. So go ahead and invite friends for that. Uh, and then we're going to pick back up in November and finish the semester strong with a few messages in November, and then we have a Christmas edge. So we're over halfway, guys. The edge is... Uh, over halfway the semester's over, which is, is sad. Um, we're excited for what Josh is going to be speaking on tonight. He's going to be casting some vision. Uh, uh, sorry about that. I'm going to be a uh, couple weeks. I'll be uh, speaking over the next couple weeks, um, carrying out some vision talks as well for the edge and where we're going in the future. Um, hopefully with some uh, good changes, things that you guys in. It's like open mic comedy or something. So uh, I think they're messing with me. They're hitting mute every time I say a word, and then it's, they're trying to throw me. 
Uh, <laughs> that was going on. I'm going to go ahead and pray for us, and Josh is going to come up and give us a great message on the going. So, uh, Father, we just thank you for what's going on here tonight. We thank you uh, that you love us and that, like Kayla said, you are crazy about us and you never stop chasing us. And I just pray for the vision of the edge over this next semester, Lord, that we finish this semester strong and that we can be encouraged to invite friends because we know that uh, when we show up here on Sunday nights and we're able to worship with you and connect with you and grow uh, in relationships with other people, Father, I just pray that happens here on a weekly basis, and I pray that we're able to extend that invitation to friends and that we can invite others into the story, the greatest story ever, and that's your love for us. That's what you did for us on the cross, and that's uh, why we're here to celebrate you, Lord. We're here to grow um, in our relationship with you. So I just pray for Josh tonight as he delivers a message, and I pray that uh, for each and every person in here, um, whether their walk is just way up top and they're just cruising right now and they're having quiet times and they're reading and things couldn't go any better. And I also pray for the student here where it's not that way, where they're at a low right now and maybe school's got them down or sports or, or relationships or things in their life or just are, are taking them for a spin. I just pray they can lean into this moment, that they can hear from you over the next 20 minutes and uh, really get something out of this and apply it to their lives, Lord, because we know that when we meet with you, when we truly encounter you, our lives will never look the same. So I just pray that over all these students in here, Father, no matter where they're at. And we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Um, sorry, seniors. I left you guys out to dry. I really did. It was just it was my bad. I said, you, I don't know if you guys caught that. This is just to the seniors that nobody else has to listen. Um, but I said, I said before worship, I said, you guys can come on up if you want. If not, no worries. And then you guys didn't know who, who came up. So that was on me. That was my bad. Um, and I apologize to everybody else for the lack of direction. I should have said, get up to the stage. Um, but tonight's going to be great. I am super excited. Um, like Tony said, we're going to have some... Some awesome vision for, I think, the future of The Edge uh, over the course of these next few weeks, and I am fired up. And in an introductory fashion, I kind of want to ask the question, uh, have you guys ever had anything happen in your life where you just like kind of had to share it? You kind of had to talk about it, like something that took place where you're like, man, I just got to tell somebody about that. I remember I was in eighth grade. I've told this story before, but I got beat up in the lunchroom and in the cafeteria, and I think Tyler Bungie was there. Is Tyler Bungie, were you there, Tyler? Yeah, thanks for jumping in, bro. Thanks for backing me up. Um, but uh, I'm just kidding. We're in eighth grade. Like, you don't know what to do when a fight breaks out, right? And so, 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 so I don't really remember what I said. I said, like, one sentence, and then I put my head down to go to sleep in the cafeteria, and then I started getting punched in the back of my head, and then I stood up, and I didn't know what to do because I had been homeschooled for, like, seven years, and I didn't know what if that fights really happened in life, and, and so I remember I stood up, and I guess, like, I had never even watched a fight to realize when you're getting punched, you should just put your hands up to protect yourself, and so a couple weeks ago, I told you that I have seizures, and I think that was my first one where I was just getting punched, like... Like that, literally, I was just getting just over and I was a human punching bag, like getting punched in my face over and over and over again. And I remember freshman year, I, 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 um, I was on the varsity basketball team, kind of, um, and so I like dressed out and, and just didn't get to play as much as I would have if I wasn't on varsity. But I, uh, but I, I was on the varsity team and I remember there's this guy named Jerome Williams who was on the varsity team. And I don't know why, but I told the upperclassmen, the story about me getting punched in the face repeatedly in eighth grade. And Jerome, <laughs> I told him this while I was watching a football game at Oakville High School. And on the bleachers, he started rolling down the bleachers in uncontrollable laughter. Like he was laughing so hard. And I, at this point, I was like secure enough about the situation. Like I thought it was kind of funny too. So it was like all good. I laughed about it. No big deal. But then Jerome, okay, like he thought it was too good not to share with every single person he knew in the school. And so like every time I was around Jerome and uh, like a new group of people came around, Jerome would say, Nibs, Nibs, tell him that story. Tell him the story about you got beat up in eighth grade. And so that's how I got really, really good at sharing the story about me getting beat up in eighth grade because like it was just too good not to share for Jerome. There's something weird about fights like that. You know that? Like there is something weird. You guys know if you're in high school, like if a fight breaks out, everybody talks about it. I remember last night, actually, just last night, I remember last night, and I was watching a basketball game, Lakers versus the Rockets. Anybody watching it? Fight broke out, and it was the talk of the bedroom. I was like, Abby, fight. This is crazy. Like, this is wild. You just got it. You got it. You got to share it. Laker fans, are you nervous yet? LeBron fans? Anybody nervous? Not nervous, Nick? 
No? You sure? I'd be a little nervous. Um, oh, and two. But you got to share it. Like, I remember there was one time my, uh, my sophomore year of high school, um, there was a kid named Joe, and he had been expelled from Oakville, so he was in scope. And then I think he dropped out of scope, actually, at this point. And so he didn't go to school anywhere. And then he, he, would, he would wander the halls throughout the day for, like, during this week because he was, I guess, bored, didn't have anything else to do. So he's walking the halls, and he would hang out with his friends who were at Oakville. And then during the classes, he would hide in the bathroom. So during passing time, he'd hang out with his friends. During classes, he'd, he'd hang out in the, in the bathroom. And I remember, like, looking back on it, I didn't think it was a big deal, but I wish I told the principal in hindsight because, like, you probably shouldn't, you know, like, that's not probably the right thing to have happening at Oakville. Um, and, and I remember, like, I heard this vocally. One of his friends, which his friends, like, they weren't the greatest crew, and their friends told him, I dare you to punch a random guy in the face, okay? Dare you to punch a random guy in the face. And so, like, it was right in front of me. Luckily, he didn't pick me. But... Picked a guy right in front of me, just sucker punched him, broke the kid's jaw, okay? Kid goes flying to the ground right in front of me. I actually took off sprinting to the nearest classroom, told the, told the teacher. He called the principal, and the principal called the cops. So really, I'd like, to save, save the world. And, 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 and then, like, it was the talk of the school. He ended up getting caught, got arrested later on, and it was the talk of the school. And it's not just fights. Like, there are things that happen in your schools where people just got to talk about it. Like, there are things that happen in your own life where you just got to talk about it. Like, your crush shot you a text or sent you a Snapchat or what's that new video app? There's something out there, right? Marco Polo, it's like, you know, the way the cool kids are communicating. So, like, something like that happened and, and, and you just got to, you, you, you have to tell somebody about it. Or maybe, like, an amazing homecoming proposal took place, which, dudes, you got to chill, you got to chill. Like you are setting up the next generation for failure. That's what you're doing. They aren't going to be able to top you. Like you got to relax. Just say, hey, girl, you want to go to homecoming? You just do something like that. But like there are things where you just like have to share. You, you guys know this is a good grade, a good achievement, something that happens in sports. Like you just got to share it. But what about when it comes to our relationship with God, like as a Christian? Like what about in, in our relationship with Jesus, are, are, do you feel that way? Like, are there things that happen in your life when it comes to your walk with God where you're like, I just got to share this. I got to, I got to talk about this. For some of us, the answer is no. For a lot of us, the answer is no. Like, there are so many things that worthy that are worthy of like passionate, exciting conversation, but. Being saved and continually changed by the king of the universe rarely makes it into our day-to-day -day life and day-to-day -day conversations, which brings us to the woman at the well, okay? So the Samaritan woman is getting some good playtime here at the edge. Um, a couple weeks ago, we introduced the Samaritan woman at the well, and we talked about essentially the goal of it was to talk about how awesome Jesus was, okay? Like Jesus is a Jewish man. Jewish men did not get along with Samaritans in this time period, let alone Samaritan women. And actually the longest recorded conversation that Jesus has with anybody, a dialogue Jesus has with anybody is with this Samaritan woman, which lets us know that Jesus is incredibly inclusive and loving and caring. And he's essentially a revolutionary who came to turn this world upside down down. And then last week, last week we talked about how this conversation was essentially wrapped up in Jesus telling this girl, I can change your life. I can change your life. They're meeting at a well. He says, I will give you living water. If you drink of me, you will never thirst again. And otherwise, in other words, I will satisfy you. This girl was looking for things in all the wrong places. She had had five husbands. The guy she was now with wasn't her husband. Jesus tells her that. Jesus says that, and she's like, wow, you know everything about me. She ends up meeting with Jesus. She has an encounter with Jesus. Her, her whole world is changed, like in a moment, in an instant. And then this is where we pick up. Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. So you see that there's something that takes place in her life that is literally too good not to talk about. Like she's so excited, immediately she goes back to her town and starts telling people about what Jesus did in her 
life. But before we go on to what she did, let's acknowledge that in order for her to do that, in order for, to ha- for her to have those conversations with the people back in her hometown, she had to have an encounter with God. Like God did something new in her life. God moved in her life. And so I want to ask you this question to start out the night. What is God doing in your life? Like right now in this moment, seventh grade guy, you're not off the hook. Twelfth grade, twelfth grader, all the way, all the way up and down the board tonight. What's God doing in your life? Or maybe a better question is this: Is God moving in your life? Like right now in this moment, could you be excited about the fact that God is 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 moving, is changing you, is is speaking to you, and is continually making you more like Jesus? Or maybe this is a better question for us to open up with tonight. Are you allowing God to move in your life? Like, are you listening? Do you want God to move in your life? Do your priorities line up with that? I think for far too many of us, and I'm not trying to be a Debbie Downer from the onset, but I think for far too many of us in the room tonight, this, the, the answer to that last question is, I just don't know. I, I, I don't know. Like, I'm not, I'm not sure about that. We can take that slide down for now. But we would say, we would say I just, I'm just not sure. Like, I don't know the last time that God moved. I don't know the last time I felt passionate about what God was doing in my life. And I think maybe the reason for that is, is because in our day-to-day life, we, <laughs> we, we, just, we just aren't necessarily paying attention to him. Our priorities aren't there. We aren't saying, hey, God, move, speak to me, because the slide is up. Let's just say it. And I think the reason, something that we need to understand at the edge is this. The edge isn't enough. The edge isn't enough, okay? How many hours are in a week? Seriously, anybody know? We can do it. Mathematics, anybody? 168. Ding, ding, ding. Well done. 168 hours are in a week. How many hours is the edge? Two hours. Two hours. And I love those two hours. In fact, I would make a, a, a biblical case for that, that the gathering of believers coming together as the church, I think it's an essential two hours in the life of a believer. I think it's an uncompromisable two hours in the life of a believer, but it's just two hours. It's just two hours. Like if the edge is all that you're getting when it comes to pursuing God, listening to God, seeking God, allowing God to move in your life, if it's the only time that you ever give intentional attention to who he is and what he's done, if it's the only time where you come and think about his word and worship him again for who he is, for what he's done, then your relationship with Jesus will suffer dramatically. It will suffer dramatically, and it will get to a point where you feel like God isn't speaking, God isn't moving, he's not doing much. I'm telling you, you were not created to live life with Jesus for two hours in a 168-hour week. That isn't what Jesus died for. It's not. Jesus died to be with you on a day-to-day basis, uh, 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 with you being empowered by his spirit to go out and change the world around you. The edge isn't enough. It's not. And for some of us, let me just say this, and this is, again, I'm not trying to be harsh, but for some of us, if that's the case, which it has been in my life many times, it's a tragedy. And it's not just a tragedy for you, but it's a tragedy for the world around you who is longing to hear about what God is doing in other people. It's a big deal. And so now we're going to continue to move on. And I want to ask this question. And tonight, really in groups, tonight in groups, like, it, I want you guys to be honest. Like, I want you guys to be real. Where, where are you at in your walk with God? Like, shoot straight. You don't need to come in, in here and put on a mask and act like everything's great. We're going to have a conversation. Where are we at? Is God moving? Are we allowing God to move in our lives? Do we desire God to move in, uh, in our lives? And we're going to chat about those types of things. But if he is, if he's moving at all, if you're excited about what God's doing, if you're pumped up, if you're fired up, let me ask you this question. Are you sharing about God with those who don't know God? Are you sharing about God with those who don't know God? Because the second thing we learned from the story is that she doesn't just have God do something extraordinary in her life. Jesus doesn't just 
tell her everything that's really going on in her world. And he doesn't just, you know, like pretty much reveal himself as God. Like, like she goes back and she shares it. She goes back and tells people passionately, I would imagine, hey, there's this man, there's this man who knows everything about me. Like, he was pretty amazing. And it wasn't creepy. It wasn't weird. Like, it was gracious. It was loving. It was kind. Like, I think he could be the Messiah. And so he's fired up. She's, she's fired up. She's, she's excited. She's passionate. And I know the dilemma for some of us right now, and if we're being real, the dilemma for some of us might be tonight that I just don't know if I'm prepared to do that. I don't know if I'm prepared to share about God with those who don't know God. That seems like a tall task. I don't know if I'm ready to do such a thing as a middle schooler or a high schooler. Like, don't I need to have more answers? Don't I need to, you know, kind of have more of the I's dotted and the T's crossed to be able to go out and share about who God is? I think all that's important. I think that's why we've done reading plans. I think that's why we push personal disciplines. I think that's why we have some difficult, challenging series regarding tough questions of the faith. But I don't think this girl, I don't think this girl had, had all this stuff figured out. Like, I think this girl still had some, you know, doubts and questions about who Jesus was. She just went back and simply shared what was going on in her world. She just went back and said, hey, this is what happened. This is what took place. This is what this man named Jesus did in my life. There's a blind man one time he had never seen before. He's a blind man, and Jesus shows up, and he, and he restores sight to this man, again, who had never seen anything. Could you imagine that? Sometimes we just read that and gloss over that. A guy, never, a guy who had never seen anything in a moment, in an instant, at the touch of Jesus, he opens his eyes and sees colors and sees everything and sees God's creation, and so he's excited, he's passionate. And then there are a couple guys, there are some Pharisees who don't really like Jesus, They're kind of questioning his divinity, and they go and they question this man who had been healed by Jesus, who had been restored by Jesus, and 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 they're like, Who is this man? Tell us about this man. And the guy got like super annoyed. And he's like, Look, I don't have all the answers here. I just know that I was blind and now I see. I don't have all the answers. I was blind and now I see. See, which I think is pretty important for us to hear tonight because maybe you're like, I don't know if God's doing much in my life. God's done something if you're a Jesus follower. Once in your life spiritually, you were blind. You didn't know what was going on. And then in an instant, as Jesus chases you down, loves you, your eyes are opened and you can see. Once you were blind and now you see. To take it a step further, once you were spiritually dead. You were spiritually lost. And in a moment, in an instant, you were made alive in Christ. It's something worth sharing. And so the question is, are you sharing about God with those who don't know God? And here's the challenge. That's the question. Now here's the challenge. Here's the solution. Here's what I want all of us to do, middle schoolers, high schoolers. I want to pray this simple prayer. We can throw it up on the screen. This simple prayer every morning. God, open a door for me today to share you with the world around me every day. God, open a door for me to share you with the world around me every day. What if we prayed that? What if we prayed that on the way to school when we woke up before we did anything else? Say, hey, God, we need your help. We can't do it on your own, but please, please, please open a door for me to share you with the world around me. And then when he opens the door, just walk right through it. And here's what I believe. I believe he will open it over and over and over again. And here's why. This is kind of a side note, but when Jesus talks about prayer, he says if you pray anything, anything in accordance with his will, it'll be given to you. Ask and you'll receive. Seek and you will find. If you ask God-like prayers, prayers prayers that are in accordance with the will of God, he'll answer them. Do you think, do you think, you can participate, I'm not going to bite you. Do you think, do you think that more people hearing about the good news of Jesus is in the will of God? You think that? So I think if we pray that over and over and over again, doors will open over and over and over again. Please, that's the challenge. Every day, that's what we're going to pray. That's what we're going to pray. Seventh grader, eighth grader, ninth grader, tenth grader, eleventh grader, twelfth grader, leaders before you go to work, 
parents, before we go to the holiday festivities with the in-laws and everybody, that's what we're going to pray. God, open a door for me to share you with the world around me. And now we're going to continue moving on in the story of the Samaritan woman. And, and, and here's, here's kind of our strategy for evangelism. Here's what we learn um, from the Samaritan woman on what she does and how this takes place. Essentially, she says, come and see. Come and see. Come and see for yourself. But before we dive into the last portion, which has more to do with the edge, I want to be very, very clear on this. We should say, hey, come and see Jesus in me. Come and see Jesus in me. What if before, like, what if our default wasn't just inviting people to church, which I'm not saying that is our default. Uh, if it is, that's awesome. But what if before we did that, they knew that they were simply welcomed in our lives, that we loved them, that we cared for them. And I'm not saying that you're necessarily going to go up to somebody and you're going to be like, hey, come and see Jesus in me. Like, come alongside of my life and there's going to be something different. No, just please make sure that the people around you in your hallways, on your sports teams, non-believers, develop some, some friendships with people who don't believe what you believe to the point where they know that you love them, that you care for them before you do what we're going to talk about next. Come and see Jesus in me. I think there's something super powerful about this. There's a, my neighbor, my next door neighbor, um, we, we met right when I moved in, and he's a guy right around my age. He's actually 26, and, and, and we, we chatted a little bit, but he's really never home, and we're really, like, never home. And most of the time when I say hi to people, like, if I see you tonight, like, if, if I saw Evan, my boy Evan, I'd be like, what's up, bro? I wouldn't necessarily say, what's up, Evan? I'd be like, what's up, bro, tato chip? You know, like, that's kind of that's how we communicate with one another. But... So, so this is what started happening with my next door neighbor. I, I started just saying like, what's up, man? What's up, dude? And I forgot his name, okay? And so it was like a few months ago, and I didn't know my next door neighbor's name. I've lived in the house for a couple years. And, and it was awkward, and, and, and I finally just manned up, and I said, hey, man, I don't know your name. I don't know your name. What's your name? And, and I knew, like, kind of, like, what it, like, I just was, I, th I was off a couple letters, okay? And it was risky to say that. And so he's like, my name's Almir. And I'm like, okay, cool. And so we started talking, and he, he knows I'm a pastor, and so we talked a little bit, actually, about Jesus in this moment out in our driveways. And he told me kind of what he believed and where he was with religion. And he's like, hey, man, we should, we should like get together on my back porch and just talk about this type of stuff. He's like, in our culture, people just like don't have civil conversation about this stuff enough. And so we're kind of playing, we're texting more, we're planning like a get together where we're able to chat and talk about this. And at the end of the conversation, something he said really convicted me. And I hope it kind of convicts you tonight. He said, hey, man, there are some things in the Bible that I really love. There are some things in the Bible that I really love. He's like, you know that part where it says, love your neighbor? Like, I love that part. I think that's good. Right after I told him I had forgotten his name. And, and I remember thinking, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that is a pretty cool part of the Bible. And so I just want to challenge you and encourage you. I think for Almir, before I say, hey, come and see, come, come to the church, maybe he just wants to know that I care about him. Before I let him know that he's welcomed at our church, maybe he just wants to know that he's welcomed in my world, welcomed in my life. And after that, we come to the part where we say, hey, come and see Jesus at church. Come and see Jesus at church. This is where sometimes I think people are like, I don't know if I necessarily, like, I don't know if I know that. If we raised our hand and said, how many of you guys came to know Jesus because of an invite from somebody, a lot of stinking people would raise their hand. Like when we've done that in the past, almost everybody raises their hand. Invites are powerful. I believe that invites change lives. I think a tangible representation of who Jesus is is seen in the gathering of Jesus' body. And I believe it with everything that I have. People who have been changed by him, people who worship him, people who use their gifts and their talents to glorify him. There's something special that happens when people gather together and people who come into an environment who have never experienced it, it's just different. It's powerful. 
it's a big deal. And so I just want to ask, like, you guys inviting? I want to ask myself, am I inviting? I want to ask the leaders, you guys inviting? Tech team, are we inviting? This has got to be part of the vision. This has got to be part of the, the culture. It has to be. If we believe this message, if we believe that Jesus has the power to forgive sins and save our lives forever, if we take that seriously, invites have to be a part of our lives. There's a story found in the Gospel of Luke, and it says this. One day, Jesus was teaching, and Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there. They had come from every village. We can throw that big old passage of Scripture up. They, they were sitting there. They, they had come from every village of Galilee and from, every, every, and from Judah and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. Okay, so just, just think about this scene for a moment. So Jesus has launched his public ministry. He's healed people. He's, he's forgiven people. He's, he's saved people's lives, like, physically and spiritually, and word starting to get out that Jesus is a healer, that if you get in the presence of Jesus, some crazy things happen, some wild things happen. And so people start coming from everywhere because where Jesus is, you want to be. Where the presence of Jesus is, you just want to go. You want to be there. You want to experience it. You want to see it for yourself. You want to see God move in other people's lives. And so a bunch of people come and, and, and experience this. And then it says this. I love this part. It says, some men came came carrying a paralyzed man on a mat and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. When they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, think about this. These are some friends of this guy who has never walked, who has been paralyzed. They, these friends, they, they went up on the roof, okay? They're carrying this guy. What's this look like? How difficult is this? What, 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 it seems like they're pretty urgent to get him in the presence of God. They went up on the roof and then they lowered him on his mat through the tiles into the middle of the crowd. Whosever house it was, was mad. They broke the roof, lowered him through the roof, right in front of Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, whose faith? The man who was broken, the man who couldn't walk, the man who might not have even wanted to be there in the first place, was it his faith or was it their friend's faith? It's their friend's faith, right? When, when he saw the faith of this man's friends, he looks at the guy who is broken. He looks at the guy who might not have even known anything about Jesus and he says, friend, your sins are forgiven. Think about how powerful that is, the Pharisees and the teacher of the laws began to think, think to themselves, who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? When I read this, I'm like, you're so close. Pharisees, you ever notice, like, they're so close. Like, yeah, 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 you're right. He's right there. That's God in the flesh. Jesus knew what they were thinking and asked, why are you thinking these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say your sins are forgiven or to say, get up and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. Immediately, this man who was paralyzed, who couldn't walk, stood up in front of them, took what he had been lying on, and went home praising God. What a story. Everyone was amazed, obviously, gave praise to God. They were filled with awe, and they said, we have seen remarkable things today. How'd that all happen? This man, <laughs> this man, he could walk, okay, never from what we know, I don't know, maybe not forever, but for a long, he, hadn't been, he hadn't been able to walk. And then on top of that, he says, your eternal destiny is Change Like, this is a massive deal. And it also shows us the importance of, of, of salvation. Jesus doesn't make them walk first. Do you guys notice that? 
He goes to what's most important. He goes to the heart. He goes to what's spiritual. He says, hey, before you need a physical healing, you need a spiritual healing. I need to forgive you of your sins. And so his whole world has changed, both physically and spiritually. Why? Because their friends brought them into the presence of Jesus. That's why. That's it. Jesus was amazed by their faith, and this guy's world was turned around. Are we that urgent? Are we that urgent? Are we that passionate about getting people into the presence of God? For me, a lot of times the answer is no. And maybe you're like, well, this, these guys seem like they're crazy. Like these guys seem like they have the biggest faith ever. Like who top of a roof, breaks a big old, makes a big old hole in the roof, drops the guy down. It seems like their faith was just extraordinary out of this world. I don't know. I don't know, first off. But second off, let's go back to the Samaritan woman. It's recorded that the Samaritan woman, as she says it to them, like, could this guy be the Messiah? That's what she says. It's like, could this guy be the Messiah? Like, her faith, it wasn't like crazy, crazy strong at this point. But look what happens when she invites these people to come and see for themselves. John 4, 39 through 42 says this. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him. Why? Because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. That was it. That's all she said. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. A whole region's changed. Samaria, the town will never be the same because of one girl simply saying, there's something crazy that just happened in my life. You got to come and see for yourself. They ended up saying to the woman, we no longer believe, this is so powerful, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we've heard for ourselves. And we know that this man really is the savior of the world. What's the vision? Understand that the edge, understand that the church isn't a two hour thing that you check off a list. The edge goes on all week. The church goes on all week. In fact, the church, the biblical definition is it's not a place. It's a people. It doesn't stop. The church doesn't stop. It goes into the world. It makes a difference. And so on a day-to-day -day basis, we allow God to make a difference in our lives. And then we share with the world about God. That's what we do. And we do so by simply saying, hey, come. Come and see Jesus in me. You're welcome in my life. I'm going to be a friend to you. I'm going to care for you. I'm going to love Jesus. I'm going to love you just the way that Jesus calls me to, or at least the best that I can. Doesn't mean that you're going to be perfect, but it means that you're going to do your best to give them a picture of who God is. And then you say, hey, come and, come and see for yourself. Just come and see what Jesus is up to in a whole bunch of other people. Come and see what Jesus is up to in and through his body. And I think if we do this, as we do this, and I've seen it in churches over and over and over again, we've seen it here. People's lives are changed. It's what takes place. That's the vision. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Um, we're grateful for you. Um, thankful for these stories and for the fact that you've been moving and working in our world for thousands of years. You've been building your church as, as you promised. And so thank you for the students in here, seniors through seventh grade, that you're continuing to move in and through to change the world around them. And Father, I pray for those of us who, who are kind of lukewarm right now in our faith and like the question of, is God moving in your life? We didn't really know how to answer that. God, I pray that tonight could maybe reignite a spark in us to at least desire you, to think about you, to worship you, to maybe re reprioritize some things in our lives that, that where that needs to happen. And God, I, I thank you that the idea of reaching more people, 
I thank you that the idea of reaching loved ones and caring for loved ones and inviting loved ones to come and see so that their lives could be changed not only in the here and now but for forever, I thank you that that's not theoretical. I thank you that your word promises, again, that you will build your church and nothing will stop it. I thank you that your word promises that you are Almighty, you are strong to save. The arms of the Lord are not too short to say, as the prophet speaks in the book of Isaiah. So God, we thank you for that. We thank you for your character. And this next song we sing out and worship to you for the sake, again, of the world around us and for our faith. I pray that in the next few minutes, our faith can be strengthened that we can be fired up about the fact that you are working and that you wanna move in many, many, many people's lives. Not just on Sunday nights, but Monday through Saturday. And the crazy thing is, is a lot of times you use us to do just that. So God, I pray that we answer the call. I pray that we can take the vision seriously and we can make it our mission to reach the world around us. It's in Jesus' name, amen. Everybody can stand up and let's go to God and worship. It's fine. 
tonight, afterwards, we're just in a moment, we're going to go to groups. Unless you're like crazy hungry, go straight to groups. Snacks will be there afterwards. And I just want to challenge you guys to, to be honest, um, to be real, um, to be open with where you're at, where you want to be, um, maybe where you're headed. And if maybe you want to contribute to seeing this vision come to life for all of us, because I know this, as the church, you desire more. You desire much more than just to attend and fill a seat for an hour and then go to groups. You desire to really be a part of it, um, to contribute to it, and to allow God to use you to continue to build his church in your schools, on your sports teams, in your families, and whatever space that you are called to occupy. And so we love you. We're grateful for you, and um, we are excited to see you next week at 11 a.m. here, and then the following week at 6 p.m., where the edge will be back. You guys can head to groups.